Now in the early 80s, the National Science Foundation began to fund supercomputer centers around the country. And in the mid to late 80s, they decided we want these supercomputers to be able to talk to each other. And what better network than the internet at that time? NSF decided to do its own activity, and the NSF started out as a kind of an experimental 56 kilobit net, and, but then eventually they did a major solicitation for a one and a half megabit NSF net, and the NSF net became a very big success. So they began to beef up the backbone of the internet and took over some of the functionality. Now look what happened. Prior to that, computer scientists and certain government research agencies were the only people on the internet. As soon as the National Science Foundation came in, all scientists were allowed. Email began to leak out from the research group, and that's when the dot-coms began to come in toward the end of the 80s and the early 90s. The backbone network was there, but the interface was terrible. It was very clumsy to get onto the net. Just around that time, Tim Berners-Lee comes out with the World Wide Web. We knew that was going to happen. Ted Nelson had been for years talking about this, and SRI had built that within their data center that we used right from the beginning to do all the documentation. And I ran the network information center on both the ARPANET and the defense data network back in the 70s and 80s. We put out uh, the directory, which was sort of the phone book of the internet. In the early days, it, nothing was online. There were no online documents, so it was a lot of hard copy and we made a transition from providing information in hard copy to providing information online. World Wide Web, which had been in existence for a number of years, but wasn't really moving rapidly compared to some of the other alternatives, suddenly had uh, this mosaic browser that came out of the University of Illinois. Uh, we had played a role in helping to support some of that. Once the mosaic browser was out there with connections to the web protocols, it became much easier for people to use it and the web just went into overdrive at that point. And now we had a very easy way for anyone to get onto the net, the backbone speed was there, the applications were there, poof, it suddenly hit the public eye. On NBC News, they said, we have a new way of you communicating with us. No, a lot of people use it and communicate, with, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? And I said, oh my God, you know, the mainstream media has, has adopted it. That's when the public saw it. That's when it began to gain significant recognition across the world. We'll never know whether Allison was able to explain the internet or not. I feel a little cheated there, so. Um, Ron Conway is an old soul in this new world. He co-founded Altos Computer Systems, took it public in 1982. He's a Forbes Midas List deal maker, and he now shepherds tech investors in the right direction. So we hope he has brought his crystal ball or his great algorithms or both to this panel on future internet technology. Thank you. Uh, I'm also proud that uh, my three sons all went to UCLA. That's the good news. The bad news, they're all history majors. C'est la vie. Uh, I've been saying for 30 years, uh, in my day job I invest in startups, and for 30 years I've been saying it is early days for the internet. Uh, we might be 50 years old here today, but it is early, early days. Uh, and on this panel, we're going to talk about how we steam ahead using the Internet technologies. I'm honored to introduce Danny Hillis, the co-founder of Applied Invention. <laughs> Daniela Russ is a roboticist and director of CSAIL, uh, the birthplace of artificial intelligence at MIT. Uh, I'm not a grad of UCLA, but this person is Henry Samueli, co-founder of Broadcom. Stephen Walker, director of DARPA. <laughs> Ed
And another grad from the Anderson School, Eric Hazeltine, chairman of the board of the Tech Leadership Council and a neuroscientist. Our first question in, that we're going to chat about is, what is each of yours most exciting future internet technology that you see coming on the horizon for the next 50 years? And Danny, uh, why don't we start with you? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I have to say that I think the most exciting thing in the universe is the way that simple things organize to cause complicated things to emerge. And that's happened over and over again in the universe. Uh, chemicals forming networks of pathways that created life. Cells forming networks that became multicellular organisms. Multicellular organisms creating brains and minds, and brains and minds creating societies. So there seems to be almost a law of the universe that individual units form communications network and then organize into something higher level and more interesting. And I think that that is happening again. The internet's part of that, obviously. And so I think one of the interesting, the most interesting things that will come out of the internet is this next level of organization, mental organization, that gets created from the emergent behavior of people thinking together. So I actually believe that our minds will literally be on the internet. Um, we'll have much better technologies for interfacing to it. We may have implants, we may have things that uh, you know, read our minds from the outside, but I believe that our minds will become connected with each other and with artificial intelligences and will cause a kind of emergent thinking, a kind of world mind. And by, by that I don't mean, I, I, I don't think of Twitter as a world mind. Um, I think if you take the, the biological analogy, the early forms of these organizations are always very simple. So Twitter is kind of the slime mold of the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's an early way of, of people having very simple forms of interactions. But I believe that actually we'll have much better ways of thinking together and thinking together with machines. And that ultimately is going to be the thing uh, that makes this development of the internet an important part of the human story or the next step in what humans evolve to. Danielle? So uh, building on uh, what Danny said, uh, to me the most uh, extraordinary potential uh, is in discovering the science and engineering of, of intelligence, what makes us um, uh, intelligent, uh, what creates the life forms that we have today. And um, how can we um, take advantage of machines to boost that? So to me, uh, it's about superpowers that we get by putting machines and people uh, together. It's about uh, bringing the internet into the physical world to um, support people with cognitive and physical tasks. Uh, it's about connecting the internet to uh, not just sensors and engineered um, objects, but also to objects that are alive. It's about understanding the language of whales and understanding the language of other uh, animals and, and uh, creatures out there and forming multi multiple levels of connections uh, between people, machines, and uh, other living creatures. Thank you. Henry. Well, Ron, if, if you had asked me that question 50 years ago, mm -hmm. I would have given you a very Simple, obvious answer. Semiconductor. We'd, we'd have to drink, uh, uh, bring <laughs> Leonard Kleinrock back. Right. It would have been semiconductors because, kind of like Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate, plastics, well, it was semiconductors 50 years ago. We've seen over the last 50 years an unbelievable exponential growth in the field. In fact, I don't know of any endeavor in the history of humankind that has had the rate of advancement of technology as fast as semiconductors over the last 50 years. It's literally been a factor of a million times better. So in 1970, circa era, the chip had maybe 10,000 transistors in it. This is a chip the size of your fingernail. Today, similar chips have 10 billion transistors in them, literally a million times more. Well, unfortunately, the party's over, and, and we're not going to see another factor of a million in the, ne in the next 50 years. It's just not going to happen because of, literally, the, the laws of physics get in the way because things have gotten 
so small now that uh, transistors are almost on a t an atomic scale already. So you, in order to get a thousand or million times smaller area, you'd have to literally be dealing with subatomic particles. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, that is another area of research, quantum computing, and that's a whole different vector we can talk about. But certainly in the next 50 years, traditional silicon-based semiconductors will progress modestly, maybe a factor of 10 better, maybe even 100, but certainly not a million. So the advances, I think, in the next 50 years are not going to be in the core plumbing of the Internet or platform, as Bob Metcalf mentioned earlier. We were talking about you know, the, the processing capability, the switching and routing capabilities, the storage capabilities. Those are definitely going to slow down. However, I think the applications of this technology will explode over the next 50 years. And that's really exciting because, again, it's actually something that Peter Thiel brought up, is that he felt that the level of innovation was extremely narrow in the past 50 years, limited to semiconductors, largely, and, and, and it's in some sense true. But once you open it up to the application space, Everything's on the table. I mean, there isn't a field of endeavor in the next 50 years that isn't going to be impacted by the Internet and the applications of the Internet. One of my favorites is actually healthcare. I think when you open up global connectivity, so everybody on the planet is connected together, coupled with the ability to take big data, which the human body has tons of data. I mean, that, it's all about big data, especially when you incorporate genetics and then artificial intelligence layered on top of that, sky's the limit for dealing with uh, disease, wellness, health over the next 50 years. So to me, that's one of the more exciting areas that I see in the application space. And also, given the slowdown of the underlying core technology, it's been like for the last 50 years, we had a tiger by the tail. The technology would run ahead, and we're just trying to hold on and figure out how to deal with it. I think given that the technology will slow down, it will give us a chance to catch up a bit and deal with a lot of the issues we heard earlier on the panels of you know, the privacy and, and authentication issues and fake news issues. So more governance policies will start to catch up with the technology, which is a good thing. I think we need that. So it's, it's a shift in focus from core technology to applications that I see. Thank you. Steven. Yes, um, I just want to take the opportunity to thank Len Kleinrock and the staff here for inviting me and for a great conference. Uh, lots of interesting perspectives on the Internet. And as the current director of the agency that helped invent it, I want to say you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm sorry, depending on your perspective. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Uh, Danny and Daniela set me up. Well, um, if you could cue up the video for me but don't play it yet. Um, I want to go back to J.C.R. Licklider. You may have seen him in one of the earlier videos. He was the head of IPTO at DARPA, and uh, his vision back in the 60s, I mean the mid-60s, was um, he called it man-machine symbiosis. We can call it human-machine symbiosis. This idea of the human and the machine becoming symbiotic, one partnering with each other. Um, a lot of talk about AI now and, you know, building the Terminator robot. I actually don't think that's the future of AI. I think the future of AI is bringing the human and the machine together in a partnership. Uh, and, uh, you know, DARPA, about 20 years ago now, started developing uh, this, the, the capability to actually uh, develop advanced prosthetics for our wounded warriors coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. These were prosthetics that were uh, lots of degrees of freedom. About five, six years ago, we did the first experiment to actually uh, implant a, a Utah array, 100 electrode array, into Jan's uh, brain at University of Pittsburgh, uh, paraplegic, uh, paralyzed from the neck down. And she demonstrated uh, the ability to control this prosthetic just by thinking about it uh, with the Utah array and her motor cortex. Uh, a phenomenal achievement. About two years ago, we, uh, we took those arms and we looked at, you know, no one wants brain surgery, right? So uh, we said, could we, could we uh, uh, take a wounded warrior uh, and um, attach 
cuff electrodes. These are electrodes that go around the nerve ending in the stump of an amputee uh, and um, capture the signal coming down from the brain through the nerve ending in the arm and control the robotic hand. And we've been able to do that using uh, AI techniques that actually capture the neurons uh, and the, the signal coming down through the nerve uh, and produce a signal that, that that robotic hand can understand. About a year and a half ago, we were able to then, uh, not a very extensive AI uh, command, but, but actually um, put some pre pressure transducers in the fingertips and actually generate a signal when he touches a shape or an object, generate a signal from a pressure transducer through a lookup table back into the, the nerve, the cuff around the nerve, and uh, provide him a sense of, of feeling, sensation, uh, which completely enables him to, to do a much better job at picking up uh, different shapes, et cetera. So what you're gonna see in the video, the first snippet, is Brandon uh, looking around in a bag for different shapes, and we tell him what to pull out, and he does. The second snippet is Kyle putting on a shoe, uh, which, is a, which is a harder task, uh, and uh, we've used some machine learning to help him do that. And then the third snippet I'll let you look at for yourself, but it's a reminder that when we do these experiments and when, when we move into the future, the human has to be the most important uh, thing we think about. So if you could play the video. <coughs> so this is Brandon with the arm, uh, and he's got to find a water bottle in the bag. He finds it, and I wish my wrist could do that but it can't. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then he's got to find a can. He kind of rummages around a little bit, but the sense of touch, sensation, allows him to do a much better job at this task than he could do if it was just one way. And you can see there's still significant uh, surgery involved, um, and it's not wireless yet. There's still wires going into the arm, but the, the, the objective is to make it wireless. This is Brandon and his wife at uh, a conference we put on. Uh. Um, and that's what it's all about. Um, and we've got to remember that the human is the center. <laughs> so that is just a look at reality today, um, where we are today. Um, it's interesting to think, though, about that technology and what it could open up for a human-machine symbiosis in the future and how humans uh, interact with the Internet. I don't have the answer to that, um, but uh, one of the things we can talk about today. Eric? So as a futurist, when I try to look into the future, I do two things. I look at what never changes and how is it going to collide with things that are certain to change. And what never changes are certain human needs, one of which is to simplify life, we are tool users and we use tools to simplify our life and the internet is a tool. And the other is to connect with other people. And so when I look at the internet and the technology that's coming at that I think is gonna be most revolutionary, ironically, as you'll see in a minute, it's gonna make the internet disappear. And the technology I'm talking about, how many of you have heard of nanocells? Oh, how many of you have heard of cells? Ah, that's a brand new one. You know, you have micro, nano, pico, and femto, and now you have atto. And basically, an atto cell is a fancy term for your Wi-Fi router. But here's what's going to happen with 5G, or if not 5G, some follow-on evolution. All networks are going to basically become one network. You now have Wi-Fi network in your home, which is distinct from the internet. That's going to go away. If you have Internet of Things, you have Zigbee, Bluetooth, 49 flavors, that's all going to go away. And so whether it's all going to be cell packets or it's going to be something else, and the reason I say that is our desire for simplicity and convenience are going to demand that that happen. The Internet of Things in the home hasn't happened because of all of this friction and the babbleization that's happened, but that's eventually going to go away. And when it does, I predict that the internet is going to disappear in the sense that it will be like oxygen. Or being more metaphysical, it will be like the force. 
in uh, the last Star Wars movie, they said, the force is an energy from all living things that holds the galaxy together. It is in everything. And I think that is a description of what's going to happen on the internet. And as a neuroscientist, I'd like to wholeheartedly agree with the earlier comments that we are going to have brain control inter interfaces. I work at Disney still as a consultant, and I did develop a mind-controlled rock. And let me tell you, it rocks to move a rock with your brain. <laughs> And it is a kick. And so I think this idea of the force, that we think something and it moves, is going to happen. This idea that we can look at something and understand it is going to happen. And so as I predict with many successful technologies, they succeed the most when they disappear as a separate entity in our consciousness. Great. Uh, the next discussion topic that I'd like to bring up is for the uh, future of the internet technology domain that each of you talked about, what other factors and dependencies are there that need to be overcome uh, for these to be enacted and be so, possible? So an awful lot of us talked about this, this brain interface. And certainly, you know, we have a very bad technology for getting ideas out of brains. With computers, it's keyboards and mice. And actually, the very best technology is the one I'm using with you right now, which is I sit here and I grunt and I flap my tongue. And that's the highest bandwidth means that we have for transferring ideas from one brain to another. That's a pretty <coughs> primitive, low bandwidth protocol. Um, so. I think that the technology that we're missing is the thing that directly reads from the brain of which you, know, they, you give it a great example, a very simple early version of that. Um, still very low bandwidth, but directly connecting into the nervous system. And I think that one of the things that's happening now is we're beginning for the first time to get enough of an understanding of the brain and enough of the ability to interpret the signals and also measure the signals so that we'll be able to have a completely different kind of interface. And I suspect the first ones will actually be implanted interfaces, um, that you'll get much higher bandwidths, which will make the things that everybody else said possible. So I don't want an implant in my brain at this point. And I hope to never get to the point where I have implants. But we also have sensors that measure act brain activity without the need of, uh, of implants and drilling. Uh, they're called EEG caps. Uh, they're very sparse. They have about 40, uh, 48 electrodes that measure brain activity, and it's an interesting question to say to ask. Well, how much can you can you get um, using these caps? So we, in my lab, we have experimented with these sensors, and the answer is fear not because we cannot read your mind uh, at this point. But uh, there are some signals that can be detected very reliably um, using um, most, rec most recent machine learning techniques. And one of the signals that can be um, detected is called the error-related potential, or in other words, the you are wrong signal. Turns out that this signal is very um, uh, pronounced, it's localized, and it appears naturally no matter what language you speak in or you think in. And so if you can detect the you are wrong signal, then, um, then people can begin to interact with machines and observe them from the distance and uh, get them to correct their mistakes in the case of robots. And so to me, uh, for, for human brain uh, interfaces, getting the external sensors uh, to be much better, to maybe benefit from a more uh, law-like uh, advancement uh, could push the boundaries. Uh, but that is not enough, uh, because if we think about human-machine interaction in the physical world, uh, we also need to have better understanding of what is possible uh, for interaction. And if you look at what machines can do today, uh, namely what robots can do today, their, their ability to manipulate uh, objects is, is uh, very primitive. It's much easier to send a robot to Mars than to get that robot to clear your, uh, your uh, uh, tabletop um, after dinner. 
So pushing the boundaries on what uh, machines can do to, to uh, more finely interact with the physical world is very uh, important. And if we can do that, then uh, we can have, maybe we can have drones that will deliver food to our doorsteps or garbage bins that can, uh, that can take themselves out and can connect with uh, the city smart infrastructure to make sure that everything um, disappears. And uh, we might even get uh, the robot chef who um, will help us all make uh, healthy food in our own kitchens. Henry? <laughs> well, I'm fascinated by you know, the discussion of your mind and how it can do things and it's so much more powerful than we really understand. We probably have to look maybe 100 years into the future. I don't know if 50 is far enough. Uh, but to truly understand you know, consciousness and, and how the, the human brain and how life in general interacts with other life forms and communicates. So I think the, the, the dependency there is on physics. I think the physicist, we need the next Albert Einstein to be born who can explain how all of these phenomena occur, the concepts of quantum entanglement, how one subatomic particle here can instantaneously affect another subatomic particle there with no delay, zero delay, things that are totally unexplainable today, if somebody can figure that all out, then maybe we can start to understand better this whole mysterious field of consciousness and how life forms interact with one another. But that, to me, that's maybe 100 years out, and I don't know if that's 50, but it's certainly an exciting area of the future. Stephen? Yeah, I think the... From our perspective at DARPA, the biggest challenge to this, this human-machine symbiosis and, and uh, how uh, the human brain uh, can actually communicate with the outside world is uh, 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 getting more data in and more data out, right, as you said, uh, Danny. Um, we have a program called NESD, and you can go on the website and look at these. Uh, I forget what they stand for, the acronyms. But it's called NESD, and it's really focused on being able to understand the human brain enough and develop the instrumentation that we need to, to basically uh, be able to read, six, I think it's 65,000 uh, different signals in the brain. Now, there's billions of neurons that can fire in the brain. And part of what we need to do is just understand the, the human brain better, uh, and that's, that's a lot of what we do in some of these programs. But we believe um, that, that in order to really do this right, I, I think I said 65,000, that's the instrument we're working on now. We believe you've got to actually be able to read a million neurons in the brain uh, and then be able to write, to be able to externally communicate about 100,000. So we're working on a chip right now uh, that can actually read 65,000 uh, 65, electrode chip. We built it at TSMC. <laughs> And um, uh, we're actually going to put that in, in non-human uh, primates here in the next month to, to, to test it. Um, that's a program to, to get more reading and writing into the brain, and it's, it still requires major surgery, right? Um, and so what we'd like to do is get to the point where we can get more signal out of the brain without the surgery, uh, which is hard because you've got this human skull that's developed over time to protect the brain for good reason. So... Um, uh, we've got another program called N3, which is focused on um, being able to, when, when a neuron fires, there's a magnetic field. You know this better than I do. When there's a neuron firing, there's a little magnetic field generated. And you know, one, of the, one of the sensors, we're working on four or five different sensors, but one of the sensors is a, something called an optically pumped uh, magnetometer. Um, and you use rubidium atoms, and you can, if you separate them, you polarize them enough, they can pick up uh, that very faint uh, magnetic field that comes from that one neuron firing. And so this is a, an instrument, a, a sensor that we're developing in this program called N3 that gets us to uh, potentially uh, doing much better than those uh, uh, helmets, helmets you yeah. mentioned uh, and, and being able to pick up on individual neurons firing. And you've got to get to that point uh, that the caps that they have now are just not uh, sensitive enough. Eric, let's, uh, so I'm let's hear the, the neuroscientist view. Yeah. Yes. That's the aerospace engineer's view of what's <laughs> happening, but you can, you can explain it better than I can. Um, 
Actually, I'm going to restate the question, I think, okay. which for the audience was, what's getting in the way of this future that we see? And you said plastics, I say software. <laughs> that if you look at a pie chart of value add in any product, what happens is it starts out with a certain amount of software, and by the end of the evolution of that product life cycle, software, he's eaten up everything. For example, if you look at an airplane like the F-35, how much did the metal cost versus the software in each of those? Uh, right? Yeah. Right? So the software dominates, and that is going to be the thing that holds us back because it's always what lags. Hardware leads software. I'm working on a project right now with special sensors, and I'm using AI. I got the physics part to work, which is magnetometers. Um, and it's taken me two years to get the software to maybe start to work. And we just don't have enough programmers in this world to write the software that has to be written to implement the vision that we're all talking about. So I think if I had to peg one thing we need to do to realize the vision and the promise of the internet, it would be to use AI to write code for which there aren't enough humans on the planet, nor ever will be, to write. <laughs> and so that's what I think. Cool. Thank you. Um, for, for each of your domains, um, what, what problem uh, does it solve and what is preventing it from happening sooner? So, can I ask the other panelists in the audience a question? I'm, I'm kind of curious. So, you express a little squeamishness about the implant. Um, I certainly, and, and I certainly think it would be better if we could avoid having doing that, but having to do that, and there are technologies, I think, that, that might. But if you could really uh, increase the bandwidth of your ability to communicate by a factor of a thousand, your ability to get ideas out and into in, in your head, would, would you be willing to get a surgery and get an implant to do that? You know, I could put a Google chip here and then I will, be, I will know everything. So that, that's, mm. that's pretty amazing. Yeah, then, and that's, well, for instance, being able to access Google, that wouldn't, that's not so far away from what you showed in the movie. I mean, it's, uh, what about the other panelists? I'm curious, would you do it? I don't like to go in for a flu shot, so no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm waiting for the non-invasive uh, right. sensor, actually. I would do it. I wouldn't. You would. About the audience, how, you know how many more about people it? in the audience would do it? <clears throat> So this is interesting. I remember asking this not question. Not a lot. Oh, yes. Not a lot. How many would not do it? Vast majority. Right. Wow. Vast majority would not. So I remember a, a panel session like this when I talked when cell phone technology was just becoming possible, and I asked the question very much like this. And people said, and and everybody was saying. You know, we'll be able to have small phones. You'll be able to have a phone with you all the time. People can call you any time. Yeah. You'll be able to talk any time. And, and I did, in a, a survey like this of an audience, how many of you would like to have a phone in your pocket? And I got about the same response. Wow. So wow. just out of curiosity, how many of people do have a phone in their pocket? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Things change. Does anyone else want to answer the question about the time horizon for what you chatted about? The time horizon to realize more of a human-machine symbiosis? I think it's a ways off. I think we're, in terms of the crawl, walk, run phases of tech development, we're still very much in the crawl phase and understanding the human brain and what it's capable of and how it works. Um, so I think we're going to be in that phase for a while. Um, but you saw from the video, uh, humans are thinking about moving machines, and it's happening. Uh, and so, uh, but it's still, uh, at this point, uh, connected by wires. Um, it will go Wi-Fi someday, pretty sure. Uh, and, uh, but how far are we from, you know, a human being be able, being able to control a swarm of UAVs? I think we're still a ways away. So I'm going to well, be a contrarian and say I think it's coming much sooner. 
First of all, when you look at neurosurgery, it's already here. There's a lot of implants with Wi-Fi's for Parkinson's patients. I have a mm -hmm. friend at the Mayo Clinic who's implanting uh, brain stimulators in Parkinson's patients, and he has an app where he monitors all of them. And so I think what wow. you're going to see is prosthetics lead. So it's already happening. But also there was a Watson come here moment in telepathy over the internet. About two or three years ago, some collaborators at Harvard, France, and India hooked up a transcranial magnetic stimulator to one person and then what's called a squid to another. So they were measuring mm -hmm. these magnetic responses of the brain. And basically, they had this person think, thumb up or thumb down, and they sent that Morris code over the internet via email from one brain directly to another. It has happened. It has happened. And curiously, I think, as often happens, the biggest breakthrough in this brain-machine interface is going to come through quantum physics. Why do I say that? What's happening in quantum computing today is that physicists and engineers are trying to find that boundary between the weird quantum world and the classical world. And they keep pushing that limit, and they'll have to have crossed that boundary in order to have a quantum computer. And there are many billions of dollars going into that. And what's coming out of that are sensors like could detect very faint quantum events like what happens inside of a neuron. So I think that paradoxically, our desire to create the super quantum brain is actually going to help us interface to our own a lot faster than people are thinking. So I might jump in to say that uh, there are different uh, levels of gradation for human-machine interaction. It doesn't have to be brain-to-brain. Mm -hmm. -brain. And there are a lot of uh, other ways of, uh, of partnering humans and machines uh, to create uh, um, super intelligence, to create um, super powerful um, uh, systems. And so, for instance, um, I'll give you an example from medicine uh, that was done at Harvard. Um, where doctors and machines were given um, scans of lymph nodes and they were asked to characterize them as cancer or not cancer. Um, the machines made 7.5% error, the humans made 3.5% error, but working together there was 80% improvement uh, mm -hmm. to 0.5% error. And this shows that you could put together humans and machines and have, what, uh, and have each group do what they're best at. So humans uh, have... Uh, have hearts and machines have chips, uh, right? Humans have wisdom and machines have uh, speed. Uh, you can put them together and you can get much more that, than what one or the other can do. And there will be a gradation uh, between um, uh, on cognitive work and on physical work that eventually will become uh, more and more intuitive. Uh, today, much, uh, we have to adapt to the machines we build. Um, but I really believe that we will have a future where machines will look at us, will have great models of uh, how we, of what our uh, tasks are, what our objectives are, and they will adapt to us rather than um, the other way around, which is what we have today. And just, oh. just to follow on on Danielle's point, um, you know, I, I wanted to show the uh, prosthetics because I, I think innovation is still happening. And that's, that's, that's some of it. I second that. Okay. But, uh, but you're exactly right. The human-machine symbiosis partnership uh, can come in so many different forms. And at DARPO, we ran a challenge a couple years ago, uh, we call it the Cyber Grand Challenge, where you, know, you use the machine to do what machines do best, search millions of lines of code to find vulnerabilities and then correct them automatically, uh, and, and then use the human to do the cleanup work, and we've got a program called Chess, looking at human machines <laughs> providing a, a, a higher level of cybersecurity than we could do just by ourselves. So, a, a good example. Okay, we're going to switch gears now. Um, uh, kind of <coughs> new new topic. What fears do you have about where the internet is heading? Danny, do you want to? Well, I think we're going to go through our the kind of awkward adolescent phase, <laughs> which we're in now. And I think, you know, there's a the terrible thing that's happening now is we haven't created our old way of thinking together used to be communities, which was a bunch of people you were stuck with, whether you agreed with them or not. And what the internet has allowed is kind of a new form of social inter organization where people are 
able to cluster with people that are very like-minded. And so we're becoming very fragmented into groups of people that agree with each other and get relatively little exposure to people who disagree and, in fact, shun those people and cut off discussion with those people and so on. So I think that's a near-term problem that is really actually threatening our democracy right now. Um, and we're going to have to deal with that in the near term in order to get to this long-term optimistic future. Danny, I had almost the exact same conversation a few hours ago. I said almost exactly the same words you, uh, you just said, so I completely agree with you. I also feel like uh, social media is moving very fast and, um, and uh, with different rules than we have had in the past. But my, I would say that we also have to add um, the great fear of uh, the spread of disinformation and uh, uh, fake news and uh, deep fakes. I think these are uh, extraordinarily dangerous. Well, I think we've heard from almost every single yeah. panel uh, today about the bad things going on on the internet, the bad actors, you know, the criminal behavior and uh, fake news and security issues and privacy issues. So there's no question, very serious issues that are out there. But I tend to be optimistic on this because where there are problems, there are solutions. There are smart people out there, and clearly there are very strong motivations to solve these problems. Uh, I think over time, and, and that's why I mentioned earlier, where the applications <clears throat> will start catching up to the technology now that the technology, the underlying technology is slowing down a bit, I think these applications will finally catch up and we will figure out how to solve some of these problems. Enough bad things will happen, and when a really bad thing happens, people solve the problem one way or another. So I think the, the know-how is there to solve them. The people, I think there are a lot of people with good ideas who have ways to deal with these issues. And there are trade-offs, and you know, you're always trading off privacy for freedom of speech and so forth. Um, but again, if you really want to solve a problem, you, you'll put forth a solution, and the government obviously has to back you up and, and pass laws to implement these things and regulations and so forth. So I'm optimistic that things will get better. They may get worse before they get better, I don't know, but at some point enough people are going to be focused on these problems that uh, they will get solved. Not all of them are technological, however. Yeah. That's true. Some of them involve judgment. <laughs> um, Steve, I, I follow all, the, all three of these folks. I do, I do tend to agree with Henry and that we are in this adolescent phase. Somebody said it earlier, which is a great way to describe it. Um, but I think, I think things are going to get worked out over eventually. But it's painful right now. Well, I want to go back to where I started. But I look at the future by what never changes with what is certain to change. And what never changes is humans want control and predictability. We do a lot to avoid uncertainty. And we also uh, have encroachments on that. When you look at the rise of nationalism, which has been talked about earlier today, one could view that as a reaction and a backlash to globalization. That when one's space is encroached upon, one tends to pull into oneself and defend it. And that is an interpretation of the nationalist trend that you're seeing in this country and others. But now let's look at the internet and technology. If the vision that we're saying is true, that the network used to be, when it was a telegraph down the road, then it was a down the hall and a telephone. Then it was down in your pocket. Now it's in your ear. Now it's in your brain. Are you going to feel encroached upon? <laughs> and so we see archetypes in Hollywood. We see the Borg. You will be assimilated. We see Terminator and Robocop and these things. And these are expressing, I think, our conscious or unconscious un discomfort with losing our humanity to technology. Your point is, technology can amplify your humanity, and I agree with that, but not all will. And I believe that what you could see is a violent counter-anti-technology reaction because people sense that things are moving too fast, they're losing control, they're losing predictability, and they're losing their humanity. And I think if you look at the rise of nationalism, when this kind of thing I'm talking about, you ain't seen nothing yet, and I worry about that. And I think that those of us who bring new technology out 
do have to think about its impact on human lives and how it could ultimately create this backlash. Uh, we have an audience question. What should I study as an undergrad to prepare <laughs> myself? <laughs> Software. How many undergrads have we got? Uh, to prepare myself to become a leader in the booming areas of the future. Well, I'd love to jump in and say uh, uh, study computational thinking, computer science, but also study making, uh, because if you know how to make things and then uh, breathe life into what you make through programming, you get some kind of superpowers because you can make real the things you imagine. I, I get I, that question all the time, and uh, my latest answer is bioengineering, because yeah. I'm so excited about how you can apply engineering to health, and I think the future is just wide open there. But I would minor in computer science and artificial intelligence because I think that has a major <laughs> application area in bioengineering. So those two, I would say, are my choices. I see the most um, change in the life sciences right now in biology, uh, biochemistry. Um, these are fields that, uh, where the most change and the most revolution is happening. So those would be great fields to go into um, from my perspective. Well, you know, I grew up in Ridgecrest up here where we had the earthquakes, and we had an old saying, there ain't no skunk so flat you can't roll over it one more time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the skunk I'm going to roll over is software. I think that if you want to go into software as a career, you've got guaranteed employment and challenging work. And even if you don't, it's going to be a necessary tool. But then I think, in parallel, I'll also say neuroscience. I think that these advances that we're talking about funded just as... DARPA funded the internet and caused magic to happen. I think their funding in this applied neuroscience of brain-machine interface is going to similarly produce revolutionary breakthroughs. And I think the best thing to do in a career is to surf a wave that someone else created. And this gentleman here is creating a fantastic wave for you to surf. <laughs> Thanks, sir. So no. I kind of agreed with Daniela's comment about making things. But I think the way to make things these days is actually becoming synthetic biology. Yep. I think that's the most promising way of making things. So I would guess that the way that we're going to solve these brain interface problems is probably not going to be a chip that's kind of old technology, but it's probably going to be some mm -hmm. biological solution. So if I, if I were an undergraduate right now and looking for the thing that was like computers was when I was an undergraduate, I would say it's in, in synthetic biology, but I think it will it's not different than studying the brain, studying the mind, and so on. It'll just be a different set of tools to do that with. So I, I just want to add one more thing. So study all of these things that we said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also learn how to be a good communicator. Uh, learn how to express yourself in writing and in speech. And uh, expose yourself to the art world. Uh, so that you can become uh, creative and you can see connections between, uh, between uh, applications and between fields. A lot of the innovation in the future will be at the intersection between disciplines. So maybe a history class or two. <laughs> yep. uh, the screen went blank, but uh, there was another question that revolved around um, you know, what's the role of government and regulatory going to be? Uh, and can you comment on that? Is it going to be a help or is it going to be a hindrance? You mean for the Internet? Yeah. The Internet? And thinking about the technologies that you each described. Being a government guy, <laughs> I would say uh, some regulation is probably needed at this point. But... Um, I'm way out of my lane talking about it, so um, I'm not gonna not gonna say what that. Yeah, the commander in chief seems to take well, care of a lot of but, uh, questions these days. But it's it's a policy, you know, question, and uh, uh, I think uh, given what we've heard here all day about the the pros and cons of where the internet is right now, um, to Henry's point earlier, um, people will figure this out, right, and and the right things to do in order to mature it. But I think I tend to agree that you probably are going to have to have some government involvement to put some regulations in place and 
control this wild, wild west that we're, we're living in here because you know, free markets are great. I'm a huge free market proponent. However, sometimes they can go astray and you need to rein them in. Um, so it's very likely, even though there are downsides, obviously, with government regulation, uh, some of these evil players, I think that may be the only way you're going to deal with them is put them in jail. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a necessary evil, but uh, I think we're going to have to move a little bit more in that direction than just leaving it wild, wild west. Another angle is to consider that when we talk about humans and machines working together, a lot of the work of the machines uh, falls in the realm of AI, machine learning, and robotics. And if we say, okay, the machines will make decisions on our behalf, then we really have to develop the technology that ensures that the operation of the machine is, um, is uh, correct and it, um, it ensures uh, consumer confidence. And that means that we also have to advance the technology. So in the case of machine learning, we have to make machine learning algorithms more, more trustworthy, more robust, more explainable. We have to make sure that um, we can provide uh, backup on the data provenance and the quality of the data. We have to address privacy issues and fairness. Um, some of these can have technological solutions, uh, but of course then they have to be coupled with uh, some form of coordination and regulation. I like to think of um, these attributes as, as almost giving machines uh, driver's license like tests where you, you take the technology for a ride to make sure that it meets certain attributes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to have to wrap up, but on behalf of the panel, I want to thank everyone at UCLA, especially, especially Leonard Kleinrock and his entire team for giving us a phenomenal day. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I love